As they worked their way through Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, Sarah observed the reporters as they asked civilians, refugees, and officials, who are you? Everyone has a story to tell. The Iranian blogger, the United Nations refugee administrator, a taxi driver, the Iraqi refugee deported from the US, the Iraqi seeking refuge in Syria, and even the American Marine. The Washington Post writes on rolling black house, and I quote, and this is all, Glidden, the storyteller, exudes intimacy and warmth in both her two watercolors and her sometimes confessional persona. And Glidden, the knowledge seeker, thinks in much the same way as she paints, forever towards the light. Um, these trips 
called Birthright Israel. Um, and what they are are like three 10 day long trips for young Jewish people. Um, you go to Israel, you have a great time, and then you know you come back and you have a connection to Israel, which is what they wanted people to go for because young Jews were not very connected to Israel. And I was afraid of going on these trips because I thought, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If it's a free trip to Israel, you be trying to sell me the country and like there's a gloss over politics. So I thought, well, maybe that would be a good topic for a comic. So I went and I took notes and I basically thought that it would be kind of like a diary comic but long, but you know, once I got there I realized it was going to be something very different. Um, I took a lot of notes. Actually, I brought a mini-disc reporter with me. You probably have never seen one of those because they only last about five years, but it's like a little CD. So I was recording what people said, and after the first night, the battery was low, so I plugged it into the wall without an adapter in Israel and started smoking. Um, and that was the end of my mini-disc recorder. So <laughs> any attempt to be kind of like journalistic with this or like a reporter was not going to go anywhere. I took a lot of notes. And tried to write down what everyone was saying. Um, but this trip, it, I wasn't a journalist, and I wasn't thinking like a journalist. This was a memoir. Um, this was about my experience um, in this place and kind of struggling with how to take what they were telling me on this trip and thinking for myself at the same time. Are they trying to manipulate me, or am I really thinking this? Um, and comics is a great medium to use if you're trying to show internal thought because you know, we don't think in just words or pictures, we think in a combination of both of them, and that's what comics are doing to make them together. And so using the comics medium gives me an opportunity to like, do fun stuff like a courtroom scene where I'm, you know, I'm the prosecutor and the judge and the defendant and I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Um, there's me rendering judgment. Or in this scene, thinking about all the different people who must have slept in this exact same place over time as this piece of land was occupied and reoccupied and reoccupied over you know, several thousand years. Um, in this scene, our guide is telling something, so I'm using comics to show me imagining these um, Syrians being forced to leave their homes and <coughs> climbing over the wall, which is the border that was suddenly created there. And it's a very emotional book. It was a lot about my feelings. Um, it's not supposed to be a history book. It's supposed to be about me and my struggle, but also, you know, every memoir I think is about something besides just the person writing it. It's about something more universal. We've all had to try and figure out how we feel about something complicated, um, or you all will. And it took me until I was 27 to <laughs> really realize that I couldn't just read a newspaper to figure out what I thought about a really complicated conflict that I had to, you know, look at myself and figure it out on my own. So, as I was working on this book, I was becoming more and more interested in journalism itself. Like, how do we learn how to look at the world? Who brings us that information? And a lot of times it is journalism. Um, and I just happened to have some friends who around the same time that I started making comics became journalists. So that's, I think it's a point, huh? Nope, doesn't work. So Sarah and Alex um, were two of my really good friends who decided just to form a nonprofit journalism collective and to go out and report on stories that they thought were underrepresented in traditional media. And I thought they were nuts, but they made it work, and they did it. Um, you know, they were based in Seattle, they called the Seattle Globalist, and they reported locally, but they also went on these kind of big reporting trips once a year, like to East Africa to report on water scarcity, uh, to Pakistan to report on education, and Seeing them do their work made me realize that I had never understood how journalists actually work. Like, who brings you the news that you read every day? I always kind of considered it like the water, when you turn it on, the water comes out. You don't have to know where it comes from. But now I wanted to know where it came from. So I would ask them questions, of course, but I wanted to know more. So I asked them if I could go with them on their next reporting project and do a book on how they work and how journalism works. Um, so that's how Lone Black Ops was born. And their goal on this trip was to look at the effects of the war on terror and the war in Iraq and how, and basically the refugees and the migrations that were forced by this war. 
Um, so we talk to experts, like the United Nations, the UNHCR. Um, we talk to various different types of refugees. These are an Iranian couple who were living in Turkey. Um, this is this amazing guy, Sam Malkandi, who is an uh, Iraqi Kurd, who was a refugee in Pakistan, in Iran, and eventually made it back, made it to the U.S. Um, as an asylum seeker of his family, only to be accused of being an associate of an al-Qaeda terrorist and being deported after five years in detention. Um, so through his story, we learned a lot about uh, the U.S. detention system um, and deportation in America. And also, the kind of the main target in this trip was Syria. Now, this was 2010, so Syria was not how we would hear about it now. Syria was actually a safe place for other kinds of refugees, for Iraqi refugees. Um, you know, they opened their borders and let Iraqis in. And so we were there to talk to these Iraqi refugees about what it was like being there. Um, not being able to work, having access to health care and some education, but also being kind of trapped in limbo. Um, and so that was the goal of that trip. Um, and so part of my goal for this book is to really show these places as they really are. So here's a photo of Sam um, getting ready for an interview with him. They actually made a full-length documentary about Sam called Barzan, which is available on Hulu and Amazon. So you should check it out if you're interested. Um, but I noticed this blue chair, this blue plastic chair in the room. And I've seen that blue plastic chair everywhere. I've seen it in the US, I've seen it in Germany, you know, I've seen it in Iraq, and it, they're probably all made in the same factory in China. And to me, I wanted to put that in this comic to show kind of like, there's something universal about all of us, and that sounds like a cliche, but it's true. You know, Sam has a very specific um, life that he's coming from. It's very different from what we know. But something that I was afraid of when making books about these places that I know most of my readers have never been to, because I don't want it to seem like this exotic, other place. Because I think that is how we often think of refugees. We think of them as an other. We think of them as people who we couldn't possibly identify with. Um, but all people are the same deep down. They love their family. Um, they want to be safe and happy. And so to me, that's kind of what this blue chair represents. Uh, if I sound a little confused while you're this talk, it's because I think I made a part of the wrong uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> I have other things I wanted to show you, but they're not here. Um, but no matter, we'll keep going. <laughs> I'll get to in the questions part. Um, so this book took five and a half years to make, and part of that is because, unlike my first trip to Israel, I had a recorder with batteries this time, so I could record everything, and I did. I wanted this book to um, be as real as possible. Because when you're making comics journals and you do have to draw everything yourself, there's a constant reminder on every page that somebody made this and that, yeah, I could be lying to you, I could be drawing things that didn't happen. Um, and I think that's the any kind of journalism. Um, you know, a, a writer for the New York Times could also just write stuff that didn't happen. But when you're working in journalism, you're building trust with your audience and your reader. So one way that I wanted to build trust was to make sure that all the dialogue was real. So I recorded everything. That's me with the recorder. And if you're wondering why I have blonde hair in this book, um, I don't have blonde complex. It's just because in my first book, every, there were like 40 people with us on this trip, so everybody had dark hair, including me. So I thought, OK, my character has to stand out a little bit. Um, a little bit of comic trickery. Um, so that's why. <laughs> I with the recorder, and it was hundreds of hours of audio tape. Um, this is Scrivener, a really wonderful uh, writing program. And there's all of my files. Some of them were like 30 seconds long. Some of them were two hours long. And so I just sat and transcribed everything when I got back. Um, it's really terrible. It's the worst thing in the world to transcribe, especially listening to your own voice. And a lot of our conversations were like over beers, you know, two or three or four, and talking very earnestly about America and journalism and how we're going to save the world or not save the world. So, so you don't want to listen to yourself having those conversations, but it's part of the job. Um, so then, for those, I kind of look and see what makes sense to put in the book, um, and I edit things down to a script. I like to work from a script. A lot of other cartoonists 
just go page by page um, and don't like things planned out. Kate's shaking her head, so we'll hear about her process in a minute. Um, and from there, I do thumbnails. Um, they have to be readable so an editor can look at them. Um, to me, an editor is really important. I like having someone uh, look over the work in progress and tell me if it makes sense. Um, and then you get the final work. So sometimes thumbnails are really just little scribbles. Um, <coughs> You're good. We have another 10 minutes. Oh, we did? Okay. Yeah. 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 Great. No, sure. um, so, yeah, like I said, I wanted this to be accurate. So, the recorder is one of my most important tools, um, but a camera is the second most important tool. Um, actually, there's no hierarchy there. They're just all together. Um, so, I take a lot of reference photos, and it's not to copy the photos, but it's to get as much visual detail as possible. Because when I draw a Damascus street corner, I want it to be that specific street corner. I don't want it to be kind of a generic street corner. Um, when I draw a guy serving tea, I want it to be the real thing. So that you know, my goal is that someone who's from there would be able to recognize that. And so that you guys are reading it can get a feel for this place. Especially a place like Syria. As I was working on this book, of course Syria was changing a lot. Um, in the five years that I was working on it, you know, it started falling apart. And I wanted to remind people that this was a functioning country. Um, this wasn't some kind of like place destined for war or just like, you know, a desert with tents in it. This is cities and these are people living their lives. So that kind of like banal stuff at the street corner is really important to me. Um, I also included things like, so you see that little portrait of Assad up in the left there? Um, so sometimes in the first pages when we're in Syria, people are noticing it. I mean, our little group is counting them because we can't believe how many portraits of this guy there are. Um, but then as time goes on in that chapter as we're in Syria, it starts just being in the background and no one's working on it. And that was my way of kind of showing how people, you can get used to things or things that seem shocking to you at first just kind of faded in the background and become part of the fabric of life. Um, and so that's why that's there. Photos aren't just for the location. Um, they also are used for getting body language right. So this looks like a very simple sequence here, but it's actually very complicated. Um, so I do a lot of photos of myself. My husband will take these pictures. You know, the shoes is bomb. This is my cartooning uniform. <laughs> Leggings. Basically my pajamas. That's the part we were struggling. So those that come this. Um, and yeah, the third tool, definitely, maybe the most important is the sketchbook. A lot of times people ask me if we draw everything on site, if you're a cart comes from us, and I wish that could be the case. If I had tons more time, I would totally just draw everything on site. But the fact is, you're constantly talking to people, and taking notes, and taking pictures, so it's not always possible. But the sketchbook is a great tool for times when taking pictures isn't exactly appropriate. So in more intimate interviews with vulnerable populations like refugees, I will do drawings. Um, you know, I'm always upfront with people about why I'm there. If anyone doesn't want to be drawn, they, I ask them and they, they can tell me. Um, and sketchbooks are also good for border crossings because you don't want to have a camera out. So whenever we get to a place where like wouldn't be cool to have the camera out. I would just draw as fast as I could. Um, this is the border crossing between Turkey and Iraq. Um, and you never know what you're going to need later, so I just use as many sketches as possible to get a feel for the place. So that building on the bottom there um, became this panel. And then this is the interior of the checkpoint. So it has some chairs. And I often do floor plans of rooms or buildings so that Afterwards, I can kind of reconstruct them in a drawing. So using those two drawings, um, I can make kind of like this. Um, there was a cockfighting scene in the book. We went to, uh, in Kurdistan to, and it's kind of illegal, not really. And our kind of fixer told us that the people who are there don't want people to know that they're there. So don't take any pictures while the fight's going on. So I did some sketches like this to kind of show what the scene looked like. And then after everyone left, take pictures of this disgusting, filthy place. <laughs> and 
that gets turned into um, the scene later. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, sketchbook also used for, there's like, it's hard to turn people into characters. Sometimes you might only have one photograph of a person, but you need to get them from different angles, and you need to kind of get a feel for them as a person. So a lot of times, and for this book, there's tons of new characters all the time. So usually I would take out my sketchbook and draw them and kind of figure out how they look. Um, this is my mate, it's not drugs. <laughs> I love from Argentina. Um, so it's there. And then start drawing. And this is the watercolor gauging process with that guy from the last slide. Kind of watercolor is not so hard. You sh if you're ever interested in it, you shouldn't be intuitive. It's kind of like eight by numbers, but you know, a little more hard than that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's hard. He was pretty angry about it. Um, and I think that's the end of my talk. So thanks so much. Samples of lace by the. And I was like, what's that lace thing going on? I don't know what it is. Is 
is a visual metaphor for my new comic. <laughs> and I could straight away think of the idea that I was going to put a colour comic on a on a on a sort of a buff coloured background and I, so that I could use white lace as borders. And the irony of using the lace as borders is not lost on me because all the scans of lace that I have in my computer are saved in a folder called No Borders. <laughs> the jungle is massive. Oh my. I don't know what I thought I'd see, but I didn't expect this. So many people, so much need. A microcosmic disunited nations. Over here is Afghanistan, and over there is Sudan, and Eritreans, Syrians, Iraqis. So that's one of the unique things about the European refugee camps, is that usually around the world, camps are, are formed from a single um, nationality that are displaced from the adjacent nation. Whereas with the European refugee situation, you have all kinds of tensions in that you could potentially have two sides from We've been in conflict with each other, both displaced to a third place. Politicians call them a flood, but of the millions of people around the world fleeing their lives, it's just a trickle. Maybe 5,000 human beings? That would not forget. Nobody knows exactly. Nobody's counting. These people don't count. Everywhere there's an air of expectation of impermanence. People who've been on the move for so long are stuck in limbo, tantalizingly close to their destination. But the wrong side of those cruel fences, still so very far. Now, there's no safe passage for refugees. They've already risked a Mediterranean crossing, the same crossing that drowned eight and a half thousand people in the last calendar year. Um, and they, they've got nowhere the across the channel. So, if there's any way for people to, any reason for people to want to get to the UK, for example, the fact that they speak English, or be, to be reunited with family members in the UK, which is one of the major reasons given. The, the only way to get across are to pay a criminal gang of people smugglers or to try and hide in a truck that's travelling and carrying freight across on the Channel ferries, boats, <coughs> or um, to try and jump onto a moving train that's going to go through the Channel Tunnel. So I had to crock this frame, actually, because um, originally it said, you're from the UK, yes? You can help us get to the UK? And, um, and then we were saying, sorry, but I had to crock it to fit the shape of the PowerPoint, and it just says, UK, yes? Sorry. And, uh, and I thought, I'll leave that, because that's what English people are like. We're just like, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you, can, you can punch an English person. I thought, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and I also believe that women should not apologise for their work because we do that far too much. However, I am aware that the artwork in the first part of this comic is really rough, it's really sketchy. I basically, I wasn't writing this for publication. I came back from Calais and I felt really, um, like, impelled to write about what had happened there. And I was, I had a week to do the comic in and I had no childcare and the kids were off school, it was school holidays and I was just like, watch TV, I'm just going to do this as quickly as I can. And then when it came back and I actually ended up working this into a book, I thought maybe I should go over and make it um, like better, like how I can really draw. But then I thought actually the style suits the subject matter. There are a lot of smiles, which I didn't expect. Everywhere little interactions, points of connection, life threads crossing. Today, we're helping to build hammock shelters with a li limited number of hammers. Eight foot square plastic shacks. It's better than a tent. My white privilege grants me the job of guarding the tool tent. We can give out a small handful of nails. I just want a lock. It's not to me. He's worked all day, but I can't give it to him. We have three padlocks in a box and thousands of people wanting them. However pointless it may be, locking the door of a dwelling when you can split the sides of the salmon knife, everyone wants to feel secure. Shabab is here alone. He's 12. The same age as my son. He's growing up far too fast. He doesn't look sad, but I never see him smile, either. We help him build his house. He's competent with a hammer, and over-enthusiastic with a stable gun. My son wouldn't know how to use a hammer unless it's on Minecraft. I give him some grapes out of a maternal concern for his vitamin intake. I feel an urge to scold him for treading down the backs of his shoes, but then I realise that everyone does it. 
It's this animal wearing culture. That will change when winter starts to bite. So that's a little moment from a small excerpt from this first comic that I did. As I said, I didn't write it for publication. I didn't even separate the different frames out into pages. I just did it bum, 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 down, one big long blog post, stuck up the internet. And it was shared more than any other comic that I've ever done online. And it crashed my website, it went viral, and then I uh, got a lot of feedback from that. And well, like the overwhelming majority of the comments that I got back were positive. I got people saying, you know, thanks, I went from Calais, thank you for telling it, people how it is. And a lot of them were. This cartoon could not be better propaganda for battlefield those who perpetrate Islamic political males invading northern Europe if they themselves produced it. <laughs> the situation would not exist if they, very people, breaking laws in Calais, did not ruin their homeland with ethnic, religious hatred, intolerance, and war, you are reporting death. <laughs> now, I mean, I've used these comments all the way through the book, and people have said, oh, look, why did you put the stuff in from the trolls, right? I don't think this is a troll. The person who wrote this comment comments sincerely believe what they say. And to them, this comment makes sense. And I'd like to engage with people who I don't believe it with and try and work out why that anyone could even think this and so what the underlying rationale of their beliefs are. However, it wasn't just because I wanted to, to talk to this person, I was glad that they commented on my website. It also indicates that I broke out of the comic only being read by the converted, by people who really knew what was going on. Because for any person who could get back to me with that opinion, versus the people who wrote to me going, oh, yay, yes, I read yeah, in the middle, there was a whole bunch of people who didn't have any idea of what was happening in Calais. And they hadn't read anything other than what you would read in the newspapers in the UK, which is overwhelmingly <coughs> hostile. And so those are some, this is an indication for me of success. And it's also a comment on the power of comic, comics. And so I decided to make all the comics fit some pages, turn it into a like physically printed comic, crowdfund for some printing costs, print 20,000 of them, and distribute them to people for grassroots comic, uh, grassroots refugee relief, potentially raising maybe about 20,000 pounds. That's the idea. This is what 20 thousand comics look like in my front room at home. Um, to the right of the picture, you, could, you can see my beer. So I had to get rid of all the comics before I could drink my beer. <laughs> the rest of what's visible there is household mess, because I truly don't believe that it's possible to have two children, a comics career, and a house that looks like anything other than therapy for other people who might worry that their house is too messy. <laughs> So, I knew I was going to go back to Calais, and I knew that I wanted to do more that was related to my artwork. And um, what I did was, when I went back, I said to the charity, L'Odeur de um, is there something in particular that could be useful? And I come up with the idea of doing portraits, because I can draw a portrait of someone, and I did it like the waterproof drawing inks, and then I could put it in a plastic wallet and give it to them, and they would have something there's a recognition of their humanity and individuality, and also it's quite lightweight, and it doesn't even matter if it gets wet. So, um, I had that as something that I could do. And they said, yeah, yeah, come to the youth centre. The youth centre is a completely volunteer a space that had been created by a building that had been donated, brought over donated by some Irish architects. Come on, sit and meet some of these kids. So, this is another 13-year-old child who's from Afghanistan. It's an intimate thing to do, to draw a portrait to sit and study every feature of a face. The impossibly <coughs> thick eyelashes. See, I can draw. Yeah. <laughs> the soft, downy hair growing on the upper lip. The strangely massive Afghan hands. The kid's ears are slightly furry too, very small and rounded. They look pallid. I idly wonder if he has his mother's ears, and then I wonder how long it is since she last saw him. I think of her thinking of him every hour of every day. That's all the kids going, yeah, we've got our pictures, we're going out in the rain now. Um, and then the other thing that comics can do is it can help you to meet people. Because I wouldn't have been able to take reference photos in the Calais jungle. 
Because of the regulations, which are particularly dysfunctional, that surround Europe, refugees within Europe, the idea is that you have to claim asylum in the first safe country that you come to. I think they formulated this proposal to stop people going, well, you can't claim refugee here in Greece, go find another European country. Instead, it's like, okay, you say you're a refugee here in Greece, right, we have to accept you, yeah? Which is all very well, but if you land in Greece and you don't want to claim asylum there, it means you have to avoid the authorities and all of their forms. It means you have no access to medical care. It means you can't even get on a bus to travel across the border because the driver of that bus can be prosecuted for people's smuggling. We met people in Calais who had walked across the continent to get there, including heavily pregnant women. So, with comics, you can meet someone. So, you can't take photos of people in, in Calais because if you did, then when they got to the UK, then maybe they would have their asylum claims turned down. Because they say, oh, look, there's a photo of you in France, go back to France, do your asylum claim there. But with comics, I can see people, and then I can, I can go home and I can draw a picture, and it's not intrusive, it's not like sticking a video camera in their face. So, let's meet Pasha. He's only in one of these eight foot square shacks, like the ones that we were building at the beginning of the comic cartoon, but he's built his own one. We all squeeze in his hut, kick our shoes off, there's only one place to go. Come in, come in! A softly padded seven foot square space. This is Alas, he lives here too. So that's two grown men in an eight foot shack. They each have a sliver of broken mirror tacked up to shave by. It's well insulated. It would be warmish, except we have to leave the door open to let in some light. I'll make you lunch. It's not a question. Hoshiar busies himself in his 18 inch kitchen, knocking two eggs together and sipping them into a pan. The sadness temporarily ebbs from his face in the process. Welcoming, cooking, sharing. You can tell the sits with his sense of how things should be in the world. We play the let's show each other our families on our phones game. She likes that picture. <laughs> and it's Hoshia's turn. Here's my mother, my sister and her children. Oh, they're beautiful. My family home, here. The contrast with Hoshia's current view is stark. What must it be like to feel homesick for somewhere it's not safe for you to be? And this is the making a cup of tea while they put six sugars in it thing, because they, oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> oh, sure. How are you? How am I? I don't know. What do I say? He doesn't even want to be here. The plan is to join his uncle in Croydon, but the longer it takes, the more often he fails to catch that elusive lorry truck, he does, the harder it becomes to even try. There is a big European meeting at the end of the month. They will work out how to help refugees, yes? The enormity, the immediacy of the problem is so clear to Harsha. But it seems obvious that politicians must want to help. But Hosha, refugees can't vote. Didn't you know? Immigrants are always feared, always vilified. They hate you, Hosha. They think you're a terrorist. That's what we don't say. So I've done quite a lot of different subjects. So I haven't always in specifically referred seeing myself as a journalist in comics. I mean, I started out doing graphic reportage from environmental activism that I was involved with in the 1990s. But the reason... It's sort of like I've formed personal narratives from political events. Like, there's an old feminist adage, the personal is political. And what I seem to have done in my reportage is I've gone around making the political personal, finding the people. Um, and often it was my fellow activists I was showing as real human beings, or, um, sort of trying to get over common media stereotypes of us as sort of other weirdo, strange environmental extremists and showing that we were all a bunch of people who were actually just trying to save the planet, okay? Um, so I've done a lot of different... Then after I did that, uh, that sort of reportage-based work in the 1990s, I've done a lot of different facts-based comics. And I've done whole books including comics. So I've done stuff about breastfeeding and about pregnancy and birth and about climate change. And I've had no problem standing up in front of people from International Governmental Panel on Climate Change and showing them a comic about climate change. 
I stood in front of a national midwifery conference and showed the women how to give birth in comic form. Um, I stood in front of the International Rosa Luxemburg Symposium of Historians and going, hey, look, I made a comic book yet. Yeah? I don't find any of that problematic. I do find it difficult to talk about refugees as though I am a voice for refugees because I am not a refugee. I haven't experienced that dislocation. I have merely witnessed a tiny, tiny thread of it. And that's partly why I chose the word threads in my comic book. So there's nothing problematic about listening to a white Western woman telling you about refugee stories. And there's also something fundamentally apolitical about the refugee relief efforts as well. Certainly within English culture, there's a tradition that stretches back hundreds of years of the lady of the manor going, you're giving out charity to all the poor people. And you can sort of see the same thing happening. It's really impressive, the amazing relief effort that's gone over to Calais. But it's also, we don't question why it's needed and work on those situations so that we're not under the illusion that we're solving any problems. Like, here I am, like an idiot, standing in a kebab shop in Brighton, saying to a traumatised Syrian guy behind the counter, I'm the kebab jungle, I was volunteering, and he's like, just take the kebab and go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this is the swearing bit, right? Now people, okay, it's not fucking, this is from my, my, my book, it's not fucking day trip, fuck misery tourism, what are we doing, swanning about Calais, congratulating ourselves on our fabulous relief effort, it's not about a punch, of white middle class do good is off on a charity holiday. And um, I commonly run up this up against this idea that comics are suitable for children, and I regularly disappoint parents <laughs> when they buy my books. <laughs> I ruined it with the Rosa Luxemburg book by quite tastefully depicting oral sex. And, uh, yeah, and then I was like, do I put swear words into this? And I was like, I cannot worry about this without swearing. So this actually happened. My friend said, you wonder if you're doing the right thing. Our relief effort is just a sticking plaster, isn't it? At my publishers, said, your book is coming out in New York and London simultaneously. We're going to change sticking plaster to band-aid. And I was like, she didn't say band-aid. <laughs> and I changed it, but I've changed it back to my presentation. Our relief effort is just a band-aid, isn't it? And I said, only in that it would hurt a lot of people if you suddenly removed it. Which I did, we did say at the time. Um, but there's Sorry, but just to describe what I mean by that a little bit more. It's that, so the people living in Calais on this rubbish dump, they're forced to live there by the police. They haven't got any food, shelter, the provision of safe drinking water or toilet. But there was 22 toilets in the camp, which is one for 208 people, and it should be 1 to 20. That should be the minimum ratio. So that gives you some idea of how inadequate the provision was there. And, um, and so people come over and, and they fill the gap and they set up kitchens and they fundraise for them and they more or less build an entire refugee camp from going down the local DIY store. The yeah, DIY store loved us, man. Um, but, but then that is addressing a wholesale failure by the authorities. And in fact, that then became um, sort of concreted into law because the Doctors Without Borders charity took the French government to court and said, you need to provide for these people's needs. And then they, um, they said, what, the judge took a look at the situation and said, yeah, yeah, you've got to put some sanitation in there, that's not good enough. But yeah, the food and all, the food and the clothes and the, and the shelter, that's okay, the volunteers are providing that. So to what extent is what we're doing genuinely helpful? And it's a question that has to be at the forefront of your mind. And there's this point where you become co-opted into unequal power structures. Here we are with the people with all the things, we're giving all the things. And at this point, there's a distribution of clothes happening for children in the, in the dome behind me. And I'm, I'm physically holding the border of the space. And there's this lad comes up to me and he's like, I don't need any, watch out, watch out, and I'm like, no, 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 don't turn the light. And I'm like, why do you want to come the border out here? And it's not a story, it's reality. Now, Sarah, when you turned up in the place, you brought your sketch, but you said, I'm here, you're part of a journalist group, and you were there to record. I didn't do that. I, I mean, there was the bit where I was doing portraits, but that wasn't, that wasn't, I didn't announce myself as a cartoonist, so I just said, it's okay, the cartoonist is here, it's fine, I'll just draw pictures. But, I, you know, most of the time, I was physically 
helping with food or clothes or whatever. And so I didn't get prior consent from people before I made the story. And I've been quite careful to preserve people's anonymity. I've conflated characters. I've changed people's appearances. But does it count as consent if I send someone a sketch of what I've done on Facebook and they send me a thumbs up because we have no common language? I mean, I don't know that it does. And I wouldn't do that again in future. So I feel it's worth highlighting that here. Because this genuinely happened. My friend who is a midwife genuinely said to me, I'm going to tell you something confident, something, and I want it to remain confidential. And I said, I wrote a drawn cartoon about it, I promise. And I lied. <laughs> so, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> well, I hope you feel inspired to questions and to just rush your brains. Don't worry about the time you can tell you to be honest, if we haven't heard the question before, I'd be really decent here with you one. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, uh, this is now actually your turn, or our turn, to, to talk about the many things you have been bringing up. And I think, um, since there are students here from various fields, from international studies, from Jewish studies, from history, from journalism studies, I think there are many things we can actually um, discuss. Um, I was... Um, I was thinking of, uh, of one of the um, uh, quotes by Joe Sacco, and many of you, I, I assume, know him. Uh, he's an American Maltese uh, cartoonist, um, and he's been uh, seen as the father and vanguard of comics journalism. Uh, and he once said when he was asked about his work that he doesn't believe in objectivity, not in the way it's being taught in journalism schools. And he said, I believe in being fair, by which he means he will show things which go against his own convictions. Now, that is, of course, not always easy. Uh, and you've been, both been dealing with these questions of, like, how much do I show? What do I show? And especially you, Sarah, have been thinking a lot about what can journalism do and what are the limitations of, um, uh, uh, of what we're doing and what role are we playing uh, as, as the ones uh, telling the story. Yeah, um, I agree with Joe. Um, and I'd even say that you can't be fair, you can try to be fair. Um, you know, every journalist or writer is coming from a point of view, is coming from a background, a set of experiences that you take to be the default, which are actually not the default, it's just the thing that you've grown up with. Um, so I think when you're thinking as a journalist, you're trying your hardest to work to see what else you might be missing and to try and be fair. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with him in that. And even that goes as far for me as to, you know, not giving too much of my opinion on people who I do agree with. Um, or like giving extra information like, oh yes, they're totally right, they're totally, this, these are good people. Um, because I feel like that's up to the reader to decide. Um, so I don't know if I'm, was our question? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, uh, no, it was really interesting about your story about Sam, mm -hmm. that until the end of the comic, we don't know whether, what was his story, or was he involved in, in anything, or uh, is he a good guy, or is he a bad guy? And, and we kind still of like, don't know. Yeah. I mean, when it comes down to it, like, Anyone who's talking to a journalist is doing so by choice, and so they're telling you what they want to tell you. So anybody could be lying, and also they could be involuntarily lying also. Um, I think, you know, narrative is how we understand the world. It's, you know, even when you're just telling a friend about what you did yesterday, you know, it's probably going to follow some kind of narrative structure. Like, this thing happened, you set up a situation, and then maybe there was a conflict, and then there's some kind of resolution, and maybe a punchline. So this is how we structure the way we talk to other people, and also the way we think about ourselves. You know, my, the way I think about my own life is a narrative, that, you know, this is the reason that I'm like this, and that's all kind of made up. This is how you understand yourself, and how you understand the world. So I think, you know, I'm always thinking about the fact that journalism is so many layers of editing and of storytelling and narrative. Um, and so you're just, as a journalist, you're just the top layer of that. You're listening to somebody's story and then you're picking what you think is important and 
you're making a new narrative out of the narrative that they've made. So it's a lot to think about. I don't know. It's really interesting. See, I didn't start out trying to be a journalist. It, although I was doing reportage, I did it as an act- activist and participant. And again, when I went up to Calais, I didn't go in order to make a story. The story that I made was by products of the facts of my visit, and, but it wasn't the primary aim of it. And I grew up with quite a strong hostility to journalism because I'd be forever be being... So my parents were involved in activism as well. So we'd go on peace marches and we'd see that the numbers that were printed in the press was far lower than the numbers of people on the march. And so there was always a, a, there was always a, a sort of a, a filter... I, I was always sort of quite dismissive of journalists, and that was even more the case with the, the group of activists that I was involved with, because if anybody ever even talked to the press, you'd be like, oh, it's just media talk. So... <laughs> you never put that in the <laughs> Yeah, I think that was just our strange company slang. So, um, so I, I've sort of come round to the idea that it is a form of journalism, what I'm doing. However, I do... Uh, I mean, one of the ambiguities that I embrace is I'm giving a fair picture of what's happening in the camp. So I'm not sanitising it according to a representation that's going to put people in the best light. So I show a riot that takes place during the distribution. And you might say, well, if you're just going to show representations of people rioting, it's going to make them look like animals. They live in a place called jungle. This is already not a good start. However, what I do is I contextualise... The, the report that I make with critiques of what it is that we did wrong that caused that to arise. And then I balance it quite inadvertently at the end of the book by showing a large-scale distribution that it proceeds very smoothly without a hitch. So I'm not scared of showing things that put people in a bad light. At one point I show the camp um, people handing out dirty baby bottles. And, but I contextualise it by saying, is it helpful if I write about the things that we get wrong? So I do show ambiguities, because that's part of the richness of human character. But also, I don't try to be objective in so far as I am I am really important to... to I, I stick to the facts, yes. But I will make as emotionally charged a representation of it that I can that is still consistent with the facts. Which I think is where we differ in our in our approach, which is quite nice to do the contrast between the two. Um, so when I come to, I, I structure the narrative so that there's a sort of a crux, which is the moment of a, of a woman getting assaulted by riot police in her home. But I use a lot of different ways of making that representation as intense as I possibly can. To use a different example, in the Rosa Luxemburg book, I, reach, I ratchet up the tension around what happens to all the people in the German Revolution after they get marched out of the newspaper building and they're lined up in front of rows of machine guns. Now I leave the narrative at the point where it looks like they're about to get murdered. If you read the footnotes at the back, you discover that they didn't get murdered because the person who's giving the account you know, is able to say, well, we didn't manage to get proper authorisation because they'll be very German about it. But... Um, but so I will leave the narrative hanging at a point which really happened, but I'll skip to the next bit because what I'm trying to do is build a story for the reader. So in that sense, I'm not a journalist, but the fact that I'm writing about current news events and I'm trying to do it as accurately as I can, I suppose I am. <laughs> I think this is one of the fascinating things for, for historians because we always try to be very accurate and sort of like, a, you know... Uh, follow the narrative until the end and be very careful, but there is a certain freedom in the, in the graphic novels that yes, it's, for example, the Rosa Luxemburg, it's very close to the historical events, but there is always, um, there, there, there are so many other things, it's kind of like a three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, so, yeah, I sometimes feel like writing history is very, makes it very two-dimensional because yes, we have illustrations and things like that. But we don't have the bodies, we don't have the interactions, we don't have the faces, we don't have the emotions. Uh, we cannot, sort of like, um, uh, we couldn't just describe them. We could never paint them in that way, which I think is really fascinating about graphic novels. And we get to build the narrative. I mean, you do that in How to Understand Israel. It's like you, you're following, because it's a memoir format, but you're following someone through the story, and it comes to a point where there's an emotional catharsis as well. So there is an overlap between this, um, you know, neutral representation of events and, and the personally charged one. 
Yeah, and, you know, the Rolling Blackouts is a story as well. And, you know, I wrote a little foreword in it in the beginning of the book because it journalism is an uncomfortable thing to do. And, like, you mentioned something like, oh, us being here is problematic. So every, everything's problematic. Yeah. And <laughs> journalism especially is problematic because what you're doing when you're doing narrative journalism, which is, you know, different from the kind of newsier stuff that you read in the paper every day, you're taking someone's real life and you're making it into a story. Um, but I think that it's worth the discomfort and it's worth the kind of the problematicness of that because, you know, it is how using story and using emotions is how we communicate to other people. It's how we can, you know, get them to sit down and actually read about something like this because most people don't really want to read about refugees. Although what I did... Um we were instructed not to ask refugees about their backstories when we were there as volunteers because it would have been traumatising for people to have to talk about what they'd been through and we didn't feel that it was appropriate. So I mentioned that out because you used to get to see that volunteer coordinator telling us not to do that. So I simply concentrate on the facts of people's daily existence in the camp and the insecurity of it and the police brutality and the deprivation that they're going through and the fact that they've got little children. And that is all the story that I report in a journalistic way. But then, I take an anonymised anonymized selection of representative stories of things that refugees have been through, and I put them into the narrative at a different point, so that then you can go back and underpin everything you've just seen, with the idea that any of those stories could have applied to any of those people. So I'm using a uh, I don't know, a novelistic technique to get round the fact that I don't journalistically delve into their backstories. <laughs> but I'm hoping it has the same effect. And there, there, there are many little stories in, in the back of, of threads that are very interesting. For example, when you describe some of the um, volunteers uh, in the warehouse and they find a box with um, goggles um, Swim, yeah, swimming, swimming goggles. goggles. Yeah. Uh -huh. They say like, oh, what should we do with all these goggles? Yeah, we don't need swimming goggles. They're not going to swim to England. Yeah. Exactly. So, I don't know, 50 pages later, we understand why they would have been helpful. Oh, yeah, then someone... Oh, it's actually only about three pages later. Three My pages friends are later. trying to help um, the refugees resist the tear gas that is being thrown by the police officers. And they say, okay, we've got cider vinegar and water, you can use it to wash your eyes with. And they say, what would be really be helpful is swimming goggles. And I go, there were swimming goggles in the warehouse. So I try and, get, I try and pick something up and then put it back in a little bit later. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll often build something up. I, I, I'm quite careful with the way that I structure it, but I'll build, I'll introduce a character and then I use flashback in the middle when I do a little assessment of the effects of people smugglers within the camps. So I go back and I show you all the characters that you've already met and then I tell you what they said to us about people smugglers. And, you know, I don't lay that out at the beginning of the story. I save that for this bit where it's more confessional, but it's also more relevant because it's contextualised into a more explaining exactly what's wrong with this situation. But, I mean, I go into a little polemical rants in what I do as well. I have been criticised for grinding an axe, but I make no apologies for it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions from you or comments, remarks? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Should I go like around? <laughs> Maybe I go around uh, and you stay here. <laughs> I think we need you, Kate. Well, you guys can switch places. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I don't know if you can do this well, I was adjunct to my books. Um, but I want to ask you um, I know that Calais was closed down, and I just wonder where all the refugees, what happened, where they were sent. Now I have to go back and write. There's a reason why I've not meant to do this, so I haven't talked. <laughs> um, so the, um, the jungle got bulldozed, and there was an official attempt by the French police to disperse people to containment centres right the way across France. And it's quite impressive that they made refugee reception centres right the way across France, because like, some of them are quite small rural towns, and they all ended up with their own pet refugee population which I think is a good thing, like if 
Or if that was a permanent solution that was done Europe-wide, that would be fantastic. Um, however, it, it didn't take any account of the need for people for family reunion with people in the UK. So there still wasn't an official mechanism for people to get to the UK who needed to go there. So we didn't under address the underlying problem because if you've got family in the UK, you will still try and get there. And um, then now, the refugee population in Calais is it's under, a th it's under a thousand people. Um, Brexit presumably made a difference. They realised that we're not actually as glowing, the golden, egalitarian, lovely country that they might have been hoping. But actually a bunch of xenophobic... <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, they're sleeping rough trying to avoid the police in Calais, and the, Cal the Calaisian police confiscate their bedding roughly twice a week. And there's been quite a lot of compassion fatigue, so there isn't the same number of donations and there's not the same number of volunteers. So it's, and it's still coming to the point where, because the refugee presence is still there, the French government are now being approached again with the legal responsibility to actually help people. Weirdly, Brexit might resolve the situation because at the moment the French border is in France. The, sorry, the UK border is in France. You've got British border police patrolling on the French side in La, Dunkirk and Calais and stopping people from getting on, on the trucks. But if we crash and burn out of Europe, as it looks like we might, then there's no reason for the French to let border guards do that job anymore, in which case the French would be like, go, 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 go to the racist country that doesn't want to be part of Europe. And we'll end up with everyone at Dover, which would be fairer, because that's where they're trying to get to. And I do believe, especially since I met Iraq, Kurds and Afghans, that Britain, as a, like an invader of those countries, repeatedly over the last century, bears some responsibility, some historic responsibility for the trauma that these people are suffering. Thank you. I just have a very basic question. Um, how did you go to market wrong? Uh, and how did you, did you take any classes if you were useful for your cartooning? Uh, or the art itself? Um, and how did you develop your style specifically for reportage? Uh, is there a specific kind of cartooning that is more useful for what you can do in the and so on. Um, you get out the first. Um, I think, well, everybody draws. I think you, when you're a kid, you draw. And I think the only difference between an artist who's been working is that they just never stop drawing. Um, but I do think that everybody can learn to draw. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to, to be an artist. I didn't know what kind exactly. Um, so comics was something, I went to art school, I went to a kind of traditional art school that in their mind, nothing ever took place in art after 1967. It was like abstract expressionism and what came before, and then there was no contemporary art. So that was bad in some ways, but good in that we really focused on anatomy, you know, lots of drawing from the figure perspective, which at the, when I graduated in 2002, like painting had just been declared dead, and I was a painting major. <laughs> I was like, why did I you know, waste my time at art school? Um, but it turned out to be very helpful to know all of those classical drawing skills when it came to comics. Um, and so I really used those a lot later. Um, and, you know, watercolor has a lot in common with oil paint. And about finding a style, you look incredulous. Yeah, I'm incredulous about oil paint and watercolor being like similar. Well, you're mixing the colors the same way. Yeah, I suppose so. I just did more of you doing watercolor. That's <laughs> <laughs> not so hard. Um, and as far as a style, I think figuring out a style is something that I thought about a lot when I was first starting out, and I think a lot of younger cartoonists worry about a lot. Like, what is my style? Like, you, you look at your own drawings and you say, I don't have a style, everyone else has a style. But it's a little bit like saying, I don't have an accent, and everybody else has an accent. You just don't see it. You don't, and it takes a while to kind of realize, like, oh yeah, this is my style. Um, but definitely, you know, it, it's, a it's a long road to to get to where you're comfortable with it. I am prepared to admit that I have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> People have like, totally not understood me in some shops while I've been in North America. Um, um, I didn't go to art school. I, my mum was an art teacher, so I think there was a lot of art around the house. She did a lot of, now sharpen your pencil, 
you know, she, she leaned over me, but, but my sister was the artist, and you know how it is when you're the second child, and they're really good at something, so you're like, I won't do that. So I did English at university, and I'm quite glad that I did, because it's made me not scared, like my first book was self-published, and it's made me not scared around analysis and theory and history and research, which has ended up being a large point part of what I did. Um, as far as drawing style goes, um, I, do, I doodled in the back of my books, and then by the time I was at, um, I don't know, Sixth Form College, it's like before university, whatever section that is for you guys, high school, I don't know, then um, I was working on a weird sort of abstract graphic novel with which I was doing with very, very, very fine pen. That I, I was just doing it because I was bored in history class, to be honest. And so I do like these incredibly detailed like fields with individual blades of grass. I never finished it, yeah. Um, but I didn't consider myself a cartoonist for a good ten years. I do postcards or a bit of a bit of reportage, and then finally I was like, no, no, I am a cartoonist. Um, my style for this book, it's the first book I've done in colour, um, and what I did was I started out with, well, drawing inks, but essentially watercolour, and on page three of the book I've abandoned them and gone for coloured pencils, because I realised if I had to mix up the face colour every time, I was just going to be there all year, and I had a week, and I had kids, etc., no childcare that week, yeah. So I grabbed the coloured pencils and I did that and I really, I'm, I'm so into my coloured pencils now. What I like about them is their consistency of colour. I know that's going to be the same colour for my, I, I, I often use the same outfit on the same person throughout the narrative so that it's easier for the reader to identify. So that's, that's that person's top, that's that person's jeans. Um, and I'll work over something with one colour, a coloured pencil, and then I'll walk, work it over with a second colour so that you get a sort of vibrancy and depth to it. So I'm just well into my colour pencil. can't remember where I was going now. Um, and, yeah, the drawing style, I just, it's a lot of drawing in a graphic novel, and I do them in a relatively short period of time, and I do very long days, and I work through my weekends, just because I end up giving myself a short deadline so I get it over with. So in that process, my drawing gets better, and at the end of it, I'm like, yeah, I can draw really well, but I'm really unfit. <laughs> you can see how creative and boring history classes can get. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very boring history teacher, not like this. <laughs> um, I have a question a little bit about the medium of using graphic novel. Uh, if you feel like there's a sort of need to through a certain legitimacy because that's a medium and comics in general are seen by a lot of the population as something either childish or that only for fiction and you feel a need to have certain markers, a way of showing this is something more serious or something that's based in reality. And then beyond that, there's other uh, limitations to the genre that you sometimes feel in your work that you're like, ah, only I was you know, doing it this way, you know, through, through some other medium, I wouldn't face this limitation. Yeah, yes to both. Um, I think that we do still, especially in the United States, because in places like France and Japan, there's a, a longer history of comics being about non-fictional things or more serious subject matter. But here it's a little bit newer. Um, and a lot of my peers like get frustrated about that, especially my peers who make fiction comics, like just in general that, oh, no one takes comics seriously. And I'm like, well, that's up to us. You know, I think it, it takes... You know, you have to put in the effort to kind of earn that trust of people. And so every comics journalist that I know, and right now there's not that many of us, so we all tend to know each other. Everyone has different ways of like proving that legitimacy, and it's something that we all think about. Um, so we all have different ideas about, you know, I know one cartoonist who thinks that every single thing should be cited within the comic, should be hyperlinked to, you know, the original source material. I think that's overdoing it, and other journalists don't have to do it, so why should I? Um, but definitely, like, you know, for me, it's all about transparency and about making that um, clear. So in my book, there's some notes in the back, you know, uh, regarding what is real dialogue. There were some instances where I had to um, take notes because recording wasn't possible. You can cite things. Um, but mostly, I think it's just by tone, by, like, it, you know, you want someone to pick it up and read the first couple pages and 
think, okay, this is someone taking this seriously. This isn't someone just, you know, having like a lock or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, the British then. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's that. And as far as constraints with comics, definitely space. Um, you know, there are times when I wish I could just have a couple pages just of prose. And actually, there are some cartoonists who do that, like uh, Posey Simmons, who's mm-hmm. a British cartoonist. She has, she really does it really well. Like, there's some pages that have a lot of prose, there's, and then there's some that are all comics. Um, and it's something that is hard to do. Like, you need to have 300 pages in order to tell a story like this, where, you know, someone who is just writing text would need less space. And that really... Um, comes into play a lot when it comes to writing books versus writing articles. So a book is no problem. Get a publisher to give you some pages. Um, But when it comes to making like work for like shorter work, which I do a lot for a newspaper or magazine or an online um, publication, if it's online, you can have as much space as you need because you know pixels are free. But when it comes to in print, there's often like really like strict um, restrictions on how much space you can have. So, okay, you have six pages to like tell a cohesive story. That can be really hard to do. So that, those are the times when I wish, like, why am I doing this? It's silly. Yeah, I'm chained against the, the constraints. Certainly with uh, the Rosa Luxemburg book, I, there were lots of times when because it's only six frames to a page, I just missed something like, I could see that she, she cut her hair off there, and she, get, she just cut all her hair off in 1891, as you do. And I just wanted her to be going like this at the beginning of the next page, but that required two frames I didn't have. So that's a continual frustration, with, like having to trim and leave things out. And that's partly why Threads, I knew that the next book that I wanted to do was going to cover a much smaller period of time, so it could be more richly textured and I could get all of the information in, instead of feeling like I had to leave large portions of it out. I would like to do a screenplay of Rosa Luxemburg, like to go back in there and flesh out all the other characters. Because an awful lot of the conversations that happened in that book kind of go, Rosa Luxemburg says something, and then the other person goes, oh really? And then Rosa Luxemburg says some more stuff. So uh, that's because I'm using it as exposition and I'm using her words. With regards to um, academic uh, authenticity, and um, I'm lucky in that I'm with a highly respected academic publisher, Verso, and they weren't expecting my Rosa Luxemburg book to be successful. They were just like, oh, I don't know what this is, comic book, yeah, well, we'll print a couple of thousand, and they sold out instantly. So it became one of their best-selling titles, and they love me now. <laughs> and it's useful because I'm in a publisher where almost every tech book in there is a theoretical text or a historical text, and then there's mine. And I footnoted uh, Red Rosa extensively, so um, I use her real words to tell the story, and then at the end I provide excerpts of exactly which words I used. So you can read my representation of events alongside with the actual events. And I haven't seen that many other comics that do that, but it's starting to happen more often. More commonly, they'll go further <coughs> and then they'll just say the time, you know, the name of the source. But I don't feel that that gives you enough information. I think you need to know, I think you need to reproduce those sources if you want the two to, to complement each other. Um, but yeah, because the other good thing about being with an incredibly academic publisher is that there's hardly any other graphic novels on the site. So, Somebody's going, well, I'll buy this theory of towards the revolutionary something, revolutionary, or maybe about comic book too. So that works fine well. <laughs> and then they got behind threads because Rosa was so successful. I doubt they would have taken it on on their own terms, but they really got behind it, and that's been great, and the production value is great, and I'm really chuffed with them. Let me just um, quickly add something. Uh, I just wanted to add that I think you're doing a very good job in Red Rosa to explain Rosa Luxemburg's uh, economic theory. Uh, yes. um, that's not an easy job to do. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, translating the stars into a yogurt. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think that's, that's capital in some way. But it's really good to It's, you know, because all these, these socialists were, I don't know, they were paid by, as you said, paid by the word, so they were going on and going on and going on and you just uh, you don't make it to, to, the, to the interesting part so uh, you actually do a very good job in that. 
Um, and I was thinking of Bill Eisner's book on the, on the protocols of the art of design, where he's doing something very um, courageous. He basically puts large, a large amount of original text, and I don't know if you've ever um, read the protocols of the art of design. It's a very, very difficult text. It's disappeared. Uh, and uh, he, he uh, makes a comic reader go for that. Would you agree, though, that it's sometimes hard to get taken seriously in the comics world as a woman? And there's sort of a, a so there's a bit more of a, an idea that comics are meant to be about superheroes and the people who do the superhero comics are the real comics artists. Because I kind of think there's a bit of snobbery along those lines. Um, I think the snobbery goes in the other direction. Oh, well, at okay. least in the, in the milieu that I'm in is, you know, everyone's doing indie comics and they're more literary comics and so there's a lot of people turning up their nose at manga um, or more popular comics um, especially that the younger generation likes so there's always going to be people who are a little bit older who are bitter about the fact that young people like other things except for what you're doing yeah um, I don't get about the big eyes but I think there's a lot of great manga out there so I have a question about process and um, the relationship between language and images and the hierarchy. You said that you start with the script, and I'm wondering if you could talk more about how um, text and image emerge in your mind and whether there's a priority on one. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I'm writing uh, the script, I can you're you're visualizing it too, and even sometimes when you're writing a script, you put kind of the script, same way a screenplay would have, like he crosses the room or whatever, um, you'll have kind of visual cues there. Um, but I think definitely I am maybe more focused on the words and the language, even though, you know, it's all made to look very simple, but I care a lot about writing. And it's sometimes like the biggest pitfall of making nonfiction comics is that you don't want to have some text and then the image is just the illustration of that text. And sometimes it is like unavoidable, like when you're talking about exposition or historical stuff. Um, but it is something that you have to like really grapple with. You're always asking yourself, why is this a comic and not just a book written in text? Why is this a comic and not a documentary? Um, but for me, yeah, when I'm writing the script, I'm definitely seeing it in my mind. Um, I don't know about you. Yeah, I, I always start with the words. And then there's a, there's a process of honing the words down so that you're on the absolute minimum which I'm now so used to that I find it difficult to waffle and write long pieces of prose. If I get journalism, like straight text commission, I find it hard to pad the words out to reach the word count because I'm really used to writing in the minimum number of words possible. Um, so I write the script and I know that's a page, that's a page, that's a page, and then I go back and I draw each page in rough and then, um, then it gets, uh, and, I, and I put the words in digitally on the computer at that stage. Then I print that out and then I draw the artwork on each page. But I do the whole book through. And in the process of laying out things on the page, I'll again lose a few more words from place to place. And there's quite a lot of challenges around making, because I'm quite free form. I mean, not, I'm, I'm, I do do panel borders, but they change from page to page. So often I spend a lot of time checking that when you read it, the next words that you read are the next words you're meant to read. And sometimes it's just a question of putting it back down, coming back, rereading it again and going, yep, that works, no, that doesn't. And I couldn't quite explain why. Wait, you how like just what are the stories that people have or? Yeah, just like were people using iPhones and iPhone, like maps to get to places. Like, did you hear any about? I know this uh, is a really specific question, but. Well, in the case of Iraqis, um, people just drove a lot of time. You know, it's not very far away, and it was a legal border crossing. Um, you know, Syria, for all the nasty things that you can say about it, did open up its borders, and it wasn't the first time when they opened up to Iraqis, they also opened up their borders to Palestinian refugees as well. 
And so that was not as much of like a problem um, for people. Like, if they could get out, they took whatever they could and, and they went. And often, you know, there were a lot of these refugees um, were middle class or even wealthy because refu people who can afford to leave the country often have some means. Whereas the Iraqis that didn't have any money at all, they would stay. And you know, Iraq was, yeah, very middle class country where you know you had a lot of people who had properties, and so they would rent them out, and they would be in Syria, and they'd have to go back to Iraq and like you know just risk the danger just to collect rent because that's they had no other way of making money in Syria. So for the people that we talked to the most, um, it was just about you know not so much about are we going to get caught by somebody, but are we going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? Um, are, are we going to be a target? Um, and that's why they left in the first place. But yeah, it definitely varies. Like, I, there was a Josh Neufeld comic. Um, I can't remember the title, but it was for Foreign Policy magazine, and it's all about the, the process of Syrian refugees going from Greece to Germany. And so he shows all of the steps that they take. They have this map that people would distribute that was Xeroxed, and it says how much it costs to get, go on each leg, whether you need to walk or take a train in this leg, and that's what a lot of refugees use to find their way. I use smartphones throughout the book um, to show these hostile comments, and also because I show photos on my phone, and he shows pictures, I show shows pictures on his phone, and part of the reason for prioritizing phones is because they are so important um, for as, as a means of creating mobility, as a, as a connection. And I do quite a bit of um, illustration work and also publicising the charity Phone Credit for Refugees, which is, you can Google it, and they take money, it's not even a charity, it's just a grassroots organisation, and they take money and directly top people's phones up. And there's been instances where people have been trapped in the back of lorries, uh, trucks, and they're suffocating to death, and they have texted for help using a phone that has had credit put on it by that charity. So I know how important it is. I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on the refugee situation. There is a book that I've just read called Refugee Migrant Smuggler Saviour, which talks exactly about the practicalities of, um, of how people move from sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the Middle East over to the UK, including the financial uh, transactions that take place, and, and some of the pressures and some of the ways in which uh, people trafficking, smuggling, whatever you want to call it, the movements of people, is now ingrained within some countries and within some power structures. I mean, this is not a situation that is going to change anytime soon. So we should have open borders. Yeah, we should have, have open borders. If we had open borders, <laughs> it would be better. That would solve everything. Very simple. Well, if we had open borders globally, then we would have a more equal society because there would be uh, less different difference between rich countries and poor countries because the people would send money home from the rich countries to the poor countries. That would be good. And it would also be good for our rich countries' economies because they mathematically modelled it. <laughs> yeah. That was a very good... Uh, I think last sentence is very important. <laughs> <laughs> We'll draw on them too. Yeah, we will draw. We will draw a lot of pictures. <laughs> <laughs>